hey, we are going to continue our series that we've been in for, for several weeks. We've been informed now. This is our 14th week where we've been experiencing and walking through and talking about what does it mean to be formed into the image of God? What does it mean to have our entire person, our whole person, transformed into his image, experience his presence? And we've been looking at like Romans chapter 12, verse 2, thinking about do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we've also been looking at Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31, where it talks about we need to love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and our, all our strength and our neighbors as ourselves. And last week, we kind of took a, a, a little bit of a turn in the series or, or started a next phase in this series where we've been talking about what are some practical ways that we can take these different parts of our whole person and be, begin to submit them to the personhood of Christ to allow him to transform us, to spiritually form us into his image. And we've been talking a little bit about our mind. And we, we talked about the fact that in this process, of being spiritually formed, that we are in a battle. Last week we talked about that we are in a war, that this is a real war, not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the darknesses of this world. And that there's three things that we are resisting, that we're resisting the, the, the flesh, the world, and the devil. And that the devil play, uh, creates deceptive ideas that play into our disordered desires and that are normalized within sinful society. And, and then we, so we talked about that that is who we are against, those three things that we're against. And we talked about the, some of the major changes that we've experienced in our culture, that idea of shifting from a majority to a minority, the cognitive majority to a cognitive minority, as well as things in our culture shifting from honor to shame and from tolerance to hostility, that these are the things that, we get, that we've experienced, that we are living as exiles here on this earth, but God has given us the armor that he has given us to wear. That's what we talked about last week so that we can resist the devil, so that we can walk in this place and, and, and win this world with the love and the goodness of God as we see ourselves transformed. And so here's the thing. I want to continue on this idea because I want to continue to step out that now that we know that this spiritual formation is a war and we're talking about knowing our enemy, I want to continue to look at this idea of this battlefield because one of the greatest things that we will fight, one of the greatest things that we will contend for in our souls is the battle for our minds. Your mind is a place that at times is, is in complete War, complete chaos, complete disarray. We live in a culture and a time where it can, it's very easy to get very busy, to get very distracted, to get very overwhelmed, to become anxious, to have thoughts that are being bombarded on your mind. It is very easy to fall into any of those areas and any of those places at any given time. And, and I believe that in this process, the mind is the place where the enemy comes to attack us the most. Which is why Romans says that have your mind transformed into the image of God, that we get to renew our mind with the washing of the word. And so we get to liberate our minds. Some of you have had this experience and you've walked through it and you're in the process of continuing to trust God in that. Some of you are here today and you feel like your mind is being held captive. Today I want to tell you there is hope. There is the way to have your mind freed by the power of Jesus Christ in your life. He came to die so that your mind would be set free by the truth of his word in your life. You do not have to be captive to thoughts that take your peace, that take your hope, that take your joy away from you. In fact, you can be captive to thoughts that produce those things inside of you. That is the thing, and that's the disposition in which we live. And so I want to look at this idea because in this idea, we need to realize something. Jesus gave a teaching uh, that he shared about the devil. And it's the longest that he talks about the devil, but it's a little different than what you and I would think. Because if we read Jesus' ministry, when we read through the Gospels, anytime that he deals with demons or devils, right, it's usually this real fantastic thing. Like, you know, demons being cast out into pigs or people saying they're legions or like, you know, blind eyes opening. Like, there's all these real fantastic things happening. But when he talks about him, when he teaches, the longest verse, the longest section of Scripture in which he teaches about the devil, what we see is a little interesting. It's maybe different than what we think. 
So I want to read this in John chapter 8, verse 31 through 47, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the things. So he's, been, he's in this discussion with both some of his followers as well as some Pharisees and Sadducees who are there kind of against Jesus. And he says this, he says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The response was, this is the Pharisees, but we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? I think this is so funny considering like their history. Like they literally were slaves in Egypt. Like that's part of their core DNA, like identity as a culture. And then as they're saying this, though they may not technically be slaves to the Roman Empire, it's a pretty close second. Like they are completely subservient to another foreign power in which they have no control. And yet in their arrogance, they're like, we've never been a slave to anything. <laughs> like, okay, maybe, and listen, I can't say anything. I've done the same thing. Maybe not about slavery, but about something else. Like, well, I've never done that in my life. It's like, you literally just did it. Like, it's literally who you are. Oh, okay, yeah, maybe you're right. Jesus replied, I'll tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So, if the son sets you free, you are truly free. Yes, I recognize that you are descendants of Abraham, and yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no room in your hearts for my message. I am telling you what I saw when I was with my father, but you are following the advice of your father. Now, this little accusation he just made. And they said, our father is Abraham, they decried. Very, very thankful, very, very arrogant about their lineage. Right? No, Jesus replied, for if you really were the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. Well, it's Abraham's example. Well, it's a lot. But the biggest thing is faith, yeah. belief, yeah. willingness to obey, that God would even raise his own son from the dead if that's what it meant to be obedience to God. Yeah. So it said, instead, you're trying to kill me because I told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. It says, no, you are imitating your real father. That was Jesus. Then it says, they replied, we aren't illegitimate children. God himself is our true father. Now this right here is a very kind translation. Because right in this thing, when they said, we are not illegitimate children, they, they in essence actually swore at Jesus because they were taking a shot at his mom. And the fact that it says, I know she said she was immaculately conceived. But since we know that's impossible, you don't even know who your father is. We know who our father is because we are good Jewish boys. You are not. You were conceived in sin and you are illegitimate. It would go as far as, say, as swearing. I'm not going to say the word in church, but you can guess what it sounds like. Yeah. Starts with a B. <laughs> I thought about saying it in Spanish, but it's really close. You just put an O on it. It's like one of the few times it actually works. <laughs> okay, my, my assistant. Okay. But that's what it says. It's literally in Greek. It's very, it is very offensive what they said to Jesus. So then Jesus told them, this is a good comeback. If God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. Remember, Jesus doesn't do anything unless God told him to. That's who he is. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. Now, this is where it gets real serious, but listen. For you are the children of your father, the devil. And you love to do evil things, you to, do, to do the evil things that he does. Now, listen, this is where he starts talking about the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell you the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. Which of you can truly accuse me of sin? And since I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? 
Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. But you don't listen because you don't belong to God. This is harsh. But it's truth. Now, there's three things, and there's more than this, but there's three things that I want to pick up from this content of Jesus talking about the devil. First of all, the word of the devil there in the Greek, and then we'll see it in the Old Testament as well. Uh, he, here's what we need to understand. The devil is not a name. His name is not devil. In fact, that's why there's an article, the devil, in front of it. It is a title. It is a title. Some people say that's like a, a slant on him. There, most people would say that if he had a name, the name would be Lucifer, what he was before he fell. Lucifer the, uh, as an archangel of, of God. But it says this. The devil, the word there, it means the accuser or to slander. The acu That's why sometimes in some passages in the New Testament, you'll hear him referred to as the accuser of the brethren. And there's a whole other side of things that has to do with like courtroom stuff that maybe we'll get into at some point, but not today. But here's some, here's some terms that, that we wanna look at. Uh, because the first thing that Jesus says is he acknowledges that the devil exists and is real. First things first. Some people don't even believe that's true. They think that's like this mythical, fake, whatever, I don't need to deal with it, it's not real, that's like a cartoon. Like, but, but Jesus is very open and honest from the very beginning. No, he does exist, he is real, and he has a title. In fact, here's some titles if we look through scripture that we can see. We see the Satan, the evil one, the tempter, the destroyer, the deceiver, the great dragon who deceives the world, the ancient serpent who leads the world astray, the prince of this world. In fact, Jesus calls him the prince of this world four times. Four different times, that's what he calls him, the prince of this world. So he exists and he shows us that this entity, this spiritual being exists and has some play, has some rule, has some authority here on this world. But there's other things that he makes sure that he lets you know because he's referencing scripture here. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 15 lets us know that he not only does he exist, but he was created by God. He is not on God's equal. He was formed and created by the same voice, by the same spirit that created the earth, that created you. He is a created being. He is not who was and who is and who will be. So therefore, he is not on the same level as God. I already mentioned in John 14, 30, it was one of the references where he mentions that he's called the prince of this world. Uh, we can see if we look at scripture as a whole and we look at the, through and we read the, this like kind of a picture book, we can see that he is like kind of the animating energy behind many of the world atrocities that we see both in the Bible and then we can probably uh, associate him with some of the more modern atrocities as well, that he is the evil behind these massive issues that we see within our world. But here's the good news. Though he admits that he exists, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, to bind the strong man, and to set humanity free. And so we see this ultimate battle, and this is why you heard the language. Jesus knew where that conversation was going before, because what did he kept saying? Truth, 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 and the devil's a liar because it's going to be a battle of truth versus lies. Jesus will bring you the truth and the devil will bring you lies. All the time, every time, without exception, Jesus will come into your life with truth. Even if the truth hurts, even if the truth stings, even if the truth is correction, it will be truth, but the devil will always come against you with truth lies. That is who they are. And he was already setting that up before he ever even heard the response. He knew where that conversation was going and he was setting himself up. There was one of us who has been with God who only speaks the words that have come out of the mouth of God, which is truth. That is me. There's one of us who from the very beginning was a murderer who was set to say lies. That is him. That is him. But it says that in John, 1 John chapter 3, it says, but when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Mark 3, 27, Jesus says, let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of the strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone who's even stronger 
Someone who could tie him up and plunder his house. I love how Jesus is like, I'm the strong one, and I'm going into his house, and I'm tying him up, and I'm taking his stuff. <laughs> that's my kind of Jesus. Yeah. Not the frilly, like, that's not mine. Mine's the one that says, I'm coming in your house. I don't care how strong you are. I'm kicking down your door, and I'm tying you up, and I'm taking your stuff, because it was mine in the first place. Yeah. That's the Jesus that we serve. Truth. Versus lies. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. If the devil exists, why do so many people have a hard time believing that that's the case? There's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of things. We have, the, we have different thoughts of like, oh, it's just like mythology. Like, it's, like socially, it's like not acceptable anymore. Like it's just like that may as well be as true as anything else that's false. We have all sorts of reasons to believe that it's not true. But Jesus never once questioned the existence of the devil. Jesus never once questioned that there was opposition to his daily life in the form of the devil and those who served him. Never once. So therefore, Jesus was never taken by surprise. Sometimes you and I, I think, get taken by surprise because we forget. We move on. We live in the world where like if you believe in that, then you also believe in aliens and like paranormal activity and like things that can float and move. And so like you're all in the same category. But that's not what we're talking about. So that's number one. Here's the second thing that Jesus mentioned. That the devil's goal is to spread death. That's his purpose. Why? Because God's goal was to spread life. Jesus said, I come so that you can have life and life to the fullest. So the enemy, devil, Satan, from the very beginning, his job has been the opposite of what God wants. So if God comes to bring life and to create goodness and to create holiness and hope and joy, he comes to bring death and violence and destruction and decay. He was a murderer from the beginning. John 10.10 10 says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus is life to the fullest. Jesus and the devil are the exact opposites. They're as polar opposites as they can be. But that's why when we live in this world, we sometimes feel like we're in this tug of war within ourselves. You're in this tug of war between things like love and lust, honesty, saving face, self-control, and indulgence. Why do we feel like we're being tug of war between these things in our lives? Well, because there is truth and there is lies. There is goodness and there is evil. These are the things that are in this world. And we, as a, as a, as a, as a people, for those who are in Christ, we get to choose which one are we gonna to listen to? And here's the third thing that Jesus talks about. That Satan's biggest tool, his biggest means of, of creating death, violence, and destruction is lies. That he is the origin, origin point of deception. And here's what's interesting, because what we would think is like his tool, like his greatest tool is probably like his subservient demons. Like that's his best tool, like demon possession. That's a really great tool. Like people rolling around, like talking like dogs or like being able to do weird magical things. Like that's what it is. And listen, here's the thing. I'm telling you that the spiritual word exists and that those things are real, but I'm telling you it is not the primary thing. And Jesus doesn't even mention those things. He mentions lies. Yep. Because I can count on one hand the num number of supernatural events that I've, I've seen and, and been part of or think that I've been part of in my life, but I can tell you there hasn't been a day gone by that there hasn't been a lie set to my mind. Amen. So you see, the real spiritual warfare 
that you and I get to walk through is not exorcisms, it's not looking for demonic forces, it's not spiritual portals that need to be closed down or any of the other chaotic, weird things that you guys talk about. The number one thing that we get to resist the devil in, the number one way in which we get to counteract spiritual warfare has to do with the battle between truth and lies that happens right here between your ears and with those around you. And we get to resist. C.S. Lewis has this great quote uh, in the screw tape letters. Uh, it, it says this, it says, there are two equal and opposite airs into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, the devils, are equally pleased with both airs and hail all materialists or magicians with the same delight. You either don't think about them at all or you think about them too much. Yeah. Which is what we've been talking about this whole series. This is, this is what the, the devil's proposition is always. Either go one way or go the other way, but don't walk in truth. Why? Because Jesus is the truth. Yeah. And that is the battle that Jesus fights because there's always one truth and infinite lies. So Jesus' way is one way the enemy's way is every other way. And we get to contend against that. We get to contend against those things. So when we look at this stuff, when we think about spiritual warfare, when we think about God, we're forming us and we would like our minds to fall in the line of, uh, into, the, into the way that Christ thinks. As he is, so am I in this world. I have the mind of Christ. I want to be, believe the truth about who God says I am and the identity of who I am so that my person can be transformed to his image. The thing that you have to understand is there will be and there already is a battle for your mind. And it is not just a like power of thinking well or because of some of your negative past or because of different things. There is a demonic force that would love to come and oppress your mind to speak lies to you, to get you to believe things so that you no longer think about God's goodness towards you and it distorts the image of God and his love for you. He does not want you to think about yourself correctly. He does not want you to think about God correctly. So he lies and lies and lies and slanders and slanders everything around you so that you believe negatively about yourself and you believe negatively about God. But when we consume the word of God, when we can tru truly believe we are who he says he is and we see who God is and we walk out his word, we can be just like Job and say, even if he slays me, I trust him. Yeah. Yeah. I trust him. because I know who he is. I know the truth. The one who makes all things work for the good of those who love him. The ones who can turn this situation around. The one who made a way where there was no way, who can make rivers in the wilderness, who can split waters and I can walk in dry ground. That is the God that I serve. So I know what I see in the natural is nothing but brokenness. And maybe the violence that the prince of this world is sowing everywhere. But I know the truth that is for me and my household. We will serve the Lord. We will walk in the truth. And I will continue to speak that truth over my mind. And I will continue to speak that truth over my spouse's mind. I will speak that truth over my children's mind. Because we will rule and be ruled by the truth that God's word has in our life. This is spiritual warfare. When the enemy says, you know what? It would be easier for your marriage if you just would both give up and go separate ways. You'd be happier. You'd be happier. That's why Paul says you can bind and take captive every evil thought and say, you know what? I know we're struggling. I know we're walking through something difficult. I know God has something better. But the end of this is not divorce. The end of this is us walking in a unified relationship as partnered together by Christ because the one who joined us together is the one who's gonna see this through to its completion. And you begin to speak the word of truth over your marriage, the word of truth over your children, the word of truth over your bodies, that you get to line yourself up with the truth of who he is. So when the accusations come, when the lies come, when the fear comes, 
when the temptation comes, when those come and it comes like a drip and it comes in the night and it comes when you go to rest and it comes when you go to close your eyes and it comes when you think you're gonna be quiet. It comes when you think you've done something good. It comes to think whenever you feel like you're doing it in a good place. When those things come, you don't have to pretend like, oh no, I don't hear them. I don't know. You can look at them for what they are. This is my opportunity to resist the devil. I'm not gonna pretend it's something else. And therefore, since I know I'm going to resist the devil, I can't go into the strong man's house. But that is where Jesus Christ comes on my behalf, and his grace is good, and he empowers me and says, I am with you, I partner with you, I've already defeated the enemy, his destination is already determined. If you need my help, I'm here. It's good to have a friend like Jesus. Because if the devil steals your stuff, then he can go with you and go steal it back. If you have small friends, they're not gonna help you. But you have a big friend in Jesus, the strong man, who says, oh, he stole your marriage? He stole your children? He stole your health? He stole your finances? You believe those lies? You fell for that? That's okay, I have the truth, and we can go and take it back. I know that, especially depending on how you grew up, maybe there's all sorts of weird background and baggage with with things of the spiritual nature, of the idea of spiritual warfare, and maybe all you picture is like exorcisms or weird stuff or people like foaming at the mouth. Like, I don't know what you experience. Like, I experienced a lot of really crazy things growing up, some of which were really legitimate and some of which were not. But you are called to fight. You are a spiritual warrior. You cannot be uh, anything else. That is who you are. And you are in warfare against the enemy who hates you, who will speak lies to you on a daily thing because he wants death for you in your life. But Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life is here. And the Spirit is reminding you the truth of his word. He's pulling alongside of you saying, we can contend against this. We can resist the lies of the enemy. We can walk in the truth. We can only speak and believe the good things. And we know that as Christ followers, as one who are filled with the Spirit, that we think on things that are good and pure and true and lovely because that is what God's mind thinks on. That is what the word of Christ says. That is who Jesus is in my life. You know what? We get to take his word and we get to put it to work in our life. We get to trust it. We get to step out on it. We can say, God, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is true. I'm looking at it. It seems hard. It seems counterintuitive. It seems different than what I think. It seems different than what the world says. But I'm willing to step out on it because you said it. And you know what? That's not testing God like, oh, God, are you going to do it? This is saying, I'm trusting you, God. I'm trusting you, God. And God is honored every time you trust him. And every time you put your faith in him. And every time you put your faith in Jesus, he shows up and he says, yeah, put your faith in me. See what happens. See what happens when you walk out in the truth of my word. I will show up because I am here for you and I will never change. I will never leave you. That's who I am. So if you say, God, I I don't know. I'm worried to trust. I'm worried to trust. I'm worried to believe. Will will, will, Will he be upset if I have a little bit of disbelief in that process? He had no problem with that man who said, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. He still healed his son. If you do it for him, he'll do it for you. Allow truth to take hold of your heart. Allow truth to take hold of your mind. We're gonna be talking and continuing to walk through this process, but your mind is the place where this battle, it will affect your heart. It will affect your body. You believe a lie here, it will go both ways into the whole person of who you are. You believe a truth here, it will go both ways in the way of who you are. It will continue to resonate out. We get to contend for the truth in our lives. Which is why 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Stay alert. Watch out for the great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 
So what does he say? Go run and hide and don't like you better be scared. Like, oh, I don't know, like well, look for somebody else. It doesn't, no, that's not what he says. He says, stand firm against him. Be strong in faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. You are not the only one who is dealing with the lies and the fear and the anxiety and the stress and the things in your mind. You are not alone. We are here together, but we are unified in Christ. We do not have to go at it alone because we can be surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that points us back to the truth of who Jesus is in our lives. Stand firm. Stand firm. Do not flee. When someone cousin says you'll never be that, oh, you're falling back in that. I know what you looked at last night. See, you are the sinner and the lustful person that you say. You can stand firm and say, I may not be perfect, but the spirit of God lives in me and Jesus' grace is more than enough for me. And where I fail, he picks me up. And in my weakness, he is strong. So even today, I stand justified and righteous. I will not believe that that's who I am. No matter what my past actions say, I know where my future is. And we stand in it. We stand in truth, firm. He goes around like a roaring lion, looking for whom he may devour. When he comes to you, make sure that he knows you're not available for lunch today. (laughs) Go somewhere else. Go somewhere else. Truth, truth, truth. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the word. The word of God was with God and became flesh. It is your very lifeblood. Which is why scripture is so important. So when the lie of the enemy comes into your mind and even sounds like your own voice, you can replace it with the truth of God's word. And truth will win. And you will be the sheep that doesn't listen to the voice of the stranger, but only listens to the voice of the shepherd. Let's bow our heads today. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you that you are the one who has overcome the enemy in our lives. Lord, And you are winning and fighting and contending for the battleground of our mind. Help us stand firm against the lies of the evil one. If there's anyone who's here today and you've never accepted Jesus, I just want to give you a chance to do that today. With every head bowed, I'm going to ask everyone to repeat this prayer. And if that's you, you just say it right along with them. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me so my sins can be forgiven. And so truth can set me free. It's in Jesus' name I pray. If you made that decision today, with every head bowed for just a second more, would you just raise your hand up anywhere in here? Just raise your hand up if you prayed that today. If you're online, they'll put a phone number up on the screen that'll connect you with our prayer team. All right, if there's any hands up, they can go down. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you're doing here in our church. I thank you for the spiritual formation that's happening. Lord, I thank you that we know that if there's resistance, it's because we're moving forward in the things that you've called for us. That if there's resistance and there's accusations, it's because you're bringing us from glory to glory and that we can walk and stand firm in your truth. It's in Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen and amen. Hey, church, we love you so much. Don't forget, next week, one service, 10 o'clock. If you show up normal time, you will be very early. Also, do not forget, go check out the Ballinger's table. It's awesome. They're amazing people. They've got great stories. Sign up for their newsletter. Uh, We love you guys so much. Have a great rest of your Sunday.